Today I want to show you a resource that I was introduced to to get a better understanding and learn more about Linux. I might have mentioned it before, but I did my bachelor's degree in like a dual study program. So I was studying at university and working in a company. And for me, that was IBM. And during the time I was always in different teams and had different things to do. And during one particular internship, I was given a resource to introduce me deeper into Linux um, because my task was to write a custom tool to measure timings inside of the kernel for very specific IO operations. And so I want to share this with you because I do think that this is actually a really awesome resource and it's really interesting. Long story short, it's about a book. It's called Linux Device Drivers and it's in its third edition. Now I have to say this book is at this point kind of old. This edition is about the 2.6 kernel and my Ubuntu here is on the kernel 5.0 right now. So a lot of stuff has obviously changed since then. But also the kernel didn't get simpler and easier with time. So it might make sense to even like go a bit back and check out these parts. Also, there is no modern book about this. I saw a post on Reddit by one of the authors that they have no plan of creating another book. The motivation for this book mainly seemed to have been to motivate and help new kernel developers to get into it. And nowadays it seems like they are pretty satisfied with the contributions they get from the industry and just other individuals. They don't seem to feel like it's necessary right now to write such a book. And also obviously writing a book is a massive endeavor and they have better things to do, I guess. So to be completely honest with you, I didn't read the whole book. I'm really bad at reading, but I did read a couple of important chapters for me. Like I said, it was also an internship. And so I was working there with experienced Linux developers. They knew, they knew their way around the kernel. They knew what I had to do. So they kind of had already an idea how to implement this task. So they were pointing me to the interesting chapters for me. And so nowadays the book is freely available under Creative Commons and you can here download it on LWN. So this book is pretty large. It has obviously a lot of chapters and I'm obviously not going to read this here, but I want to try to share one key lesson that I took away from when I was working with this. So I actually don't quite remember in which chapter it was. And I also don't know if the code and everything will still work. So let's see how this goes. Chapter one, an introduction to device drivers. The operating system wants a dark and mysterious area whose code was restricted to a small number of programmers can now be readily examined, understood, and modified by anybody. The Linux kernel remains a large and complex body of code, however, and would-be kernel hackers need an entry point where they can approach the code without being overwhelmed by complexity. Often, device drivers provide that gateway. I would say this is definitely true. I mean, I'm by no means a kernel hacker, but I feel like this book and the particular part that I try to show you today is what kind of like clicked for me and made me really understand a certain important aspect of Linux. And it took my fear away of also looking into the Linux kernel source code and kind of provide me a gateway into it. This book teaches you how to write your own drivers and how to hack around in related parts of the kernel. As you learn to write drivers, you find out a lot about the Linux kernel in general. This may help you understand how your machine works and why things aren't always as fast as you expect or don't do quite what you want. We introduce new ideas gradually, starting off with very simple drivers and building on them. Every new concept is accompanied by sample code that doesn't need special hardware to be tested. I think this sounds really interesting and sounds like a great opportunity to learn something. Obviously, I don't have the time in this video to like talk about everything. And obviously, that would also be a dumb video. You can just read it yourself. But there are a lot of interesting parts, especially also in this introduction, you get a lot of interesting insight into kind of the ideas of the Linux kernel. So for example, here, how the kernel is split up in different parts. They even talk here about security issues. And they even talk about concurrency and race conditions. Of course, this area is also important for security. If you want to find the vulnerability in a kernel or even exploit it, you need to understand how the kernel works. And also, obviously, when you develop for the kernel, you also need to know about security to make sure you have safe code. And here we get to the first more relevant information that we need. One of the good features of Linux is the ability to extend at runtime the set of features offered by the kernel. This maybe sound trivial, but it's not given that a system has to be able to somehow load code, new additional code into the kernel. This is a great feature of Linux. Each piece of code that can be added to the kernel at runtime is called a module. Each module is made up of an object code. It can be dynamically linked to the running kernel by the insmod program 
program and be unlinked by the RM mod program. And now it introduces the different classes of devices and modules. There are char modules, block modules, or network modules. And I want to specifically look at character devices. A character char device is one that can be accessed as a stream of bytes, like a file. A char driver is in charge of implementing this behavior. Such a driver usually implements at least the open, close, read and write system calls. Maybe you can slowly see where this is going. The text console slash dev console and the serial ports as slash dev, tty and others are examples of char devices. Char devices are accessed by means of file system nodes such as dev tty1. See where this is slowly going? You probably have heard of it before. Everything in Linux is a file. But this seems so difficult to understand, to grasp this concept. So for example, I was coming from Windows and you know, I, I knew files. I can click on them, double click and like an image comes up or a Word document or a game starts. But files can be so much more. But there's more to what a file can be, especially on Linux. And so whatever these char devices are, they can be accessed through a file system path and they look like a file to you, but actually they implement something much more. All right, let's start by building and running modules. Let's see if just the hello world module still works. Okay, so here we have the code. We define two functions, a hello init and a hello exit. The names basically don't matter. We use module init and module exit to define which ones are the init and exit functions for our module. Also notice how we are not using printfs here, but printk. We are not in user land. We don't have libc. We are writing code that is running in the kernel. We are not running in user space. So we cannot use typical code that you would use in user space. And so in the kernel, there's a special print method called printk, print kernel. We will see in a moment where this gets printed. Okay, so how do we compile this? I don't remember. Okay, so they use here a make file. You must have a properly configured and built kernel tree in a place where the make file is able to find it. Okay, I think I think I need to set up my system here first. Okay, so let's try to figure this out for Ubuntu. Here's also a repository with the Linux device drivers three examples updated to work in recent kernels. So I hope that we can find here some setup information. So let's figure out maybe in the make file how it works. Okay, it goes into all the subdirectories for compilation. So let's see if we can find the hello world in here. Okay, so here's the hello world code. So let's see that make file. Looking at this make file, it specifies here a kernel directory in lib modules and then and then it gets the version and then build. And I have that here already. So maybe we can actually use it already. So let's copy that make file. And we only have hello. Let's see if that worked. Okay, I think this worked. We have now here a hello.o file. So can we now do insmod hello o? Is this the wrong file? Is it ko? Okay, this worked, I think, no error. Okay, wait, so this is the kernel object, I guess. Okay, so this one is the correct one. So now with lsmod, we should see that our module is loaded. Yeah, there it is. Our module hello is loaded, but we didn't see the hello world output, so where's that? So let's look into the syslog. There it is, there's our hello world. And now let's remove the module. Now we should have removed it. Let's check the syslog. And there it is. Goodbye, cruel world. Okay, awesome. So we can write and compile kernel modules and they will be executed inside of the kernel. They are not user space programs. They executed in the kernel. Isn't this cool? It's code that is running in the kernel. Let's check out chapter three, char drivers. Throughout the chapter, we present code fragments extracted from a real device driver, skull, simple character utility for loading localities. Skull is a char driver that acts on a memory area as thought it were a device. In this chapter, we use the word device interchangeably with the memory area used by Skull. It will create four devices, each consisting of a memory area that is both global and persistent. Global means that if the device is opened multiple times, the data contained within the device is shared by all the file descriptors that opened it. Persistent means that if the device is closed and reopened, data isn't lost. This device can be fun to work with because it can be accessed and tested using conventional commands such as cp, copy, cat, and shell IO redirection. And then there are a couple of other devices created, skull pipe, skull single, skull pref, but I'm not really interested in those. Char devices are accessed through names in the file system, so files. Those names are called special files or device 
files or simply nodes of the file system tree. They are conventionally located in the slash dev directory. Special files for jar drivers are identified by a C in the first column of the output ls-l. So let's check that out. So look at this. Here we have char devices. And this here is obviously a directory, so it has a D. And when we scroll down, we can also find a B, which means these are block devices. They are all nodes, they all look like files, but some files are directories, some files are character devices, and some files are block devices. If you issue the ls-l command, you will see two numbers separated by a comma in the device files entries before the date of the last modification, where the file length normally appears. These numbers are the major and minor device numbers of the particular device. So here, now you know what these numbers here mean. It's the device number 10 and has the minor number 175. And you can check the devices that exist in proc devices. Okay, we clearly don't have the time to go through like it step by step, so let me just grab the whole repository with the examples. Okay, so we can't compile it, we get an error. It has here three arguments, but it takes only two. Obviously, this is a common issue, so here is a change in the 5.0 kernel that access OK now takes two and not three. So I guess it drops the type, so let's just change that and hope it works. Okay, so now we were able to build it, but I want to make a small modification to show you something. Okay, so here's the skull open method. So let me add a print k here. And then we have here the read, and I want to show how many bytes we are reading. And then we have here the write. I want to also show how many bytes are being written. And then we have the release here. So what are these functions? So down here, we find a struct called file operations. And you will find here seek, read, write, open, release, and IO control. Each field in the structure must point to the function in the driver that implements a specific operation or be left null for unsupported operations. And so for example, the read function is used to retrieve data from the device and a null pointer in this position causes the read system call to fail, the read system call. So we are creating here a character driver, which looks like a file, that implements functionality for typical system calls like open, read, and write. So let's build the code. And then we have here this script called skull load. And it does a few things that are explained in the book, but most importantly, it's using insmod to add our module that we are just compiling. And then it's setting up the device properly in the file system. All right, okay, so it should be loaded. Okay, now we can find here dev skull 0, 1, 2, and 3. Now I have two windows open. So on the left, we just uh, look at the syslog with tail minus f to see always new messages. And now here on the right, let me get a Python prompt. And now let me open one of the skull files. Now I'm opening the skull 0 device like I would open any other files with w so that we can also write to it. Oh, permission denied. Um, pseudo Python. Let's do that again. So now I have opened this file and see our code was executed. Our print k was executed. When we executed open in Python, Python eventually called the syscall open and then kernel magic happened. And then it saw that we want to open this device and it looks into this file operation structure and finds okay, this is, this is what I have to execute on an open. And then it executed this code here with our printf. Now, we didn't go over the code what it's doing here, but see, it can also check if it was opened write only. And now let's write something to the file. Oh. <laughs> um, okay, I'm not quite sure why it didn't show up. Actually, I'm just acting. Uh, I did this before and I failed and I figured out what happens. So let me now close this file. And now you can see we entered the write function and wrote 11 bytes. And after that, we got the release because we closed this file, we released it. So here you can also see some buffering going on. Just because we called write on the file didn't mean that Python was immediately creating a syscall to write to it. But when we said we wanted to close it, then the buffer had to be flushed and actually be written and then it's when it happens. Okay, I'm, to be honest, I'm not quite sure if Python is buffering here or, or if maybe even the kernel internally is buffering before it's writing to the device. Not quite sure about that. But let's see if we can force a flush. Yeah, so this works also. If we call flush, then this 
wherever this buffer is, either it's in Python or in the kernel, it will actually then flush it and then write it to the device. And how does it write this information to the device? Think about now you had opened a different file, a regular file, and you would write to it. How would it actually write to the device? How would it write it to the hard drive, your USB stick? Somewhere the kernel has to call a driver, hey, please write this data now to the device. And so that's what these drivers do, right? In our case, we just have this kind of like basic dumb driver that does now nothing else that just like prints here now that we were writing 11 bytes. But you could imagine that this is now accessing real hardware and telling, please write this data here at this address on, on this hard drive. I hope you enjoyed this playing around with it. And, and I really encourage you to do this yourself. For me, this was really like the mind blowing moment when I realized, oh, this is what it means to have a driver. And this is what it means to have files on Linux. In the end, you are calling syscalls like open and read and they get through the kernel code wherever they need to go. In this case, it was our own driver and we were handling the read and write, but it could also be the driver of a device and that driver then does all the low level magic to actually make that happen. And here you can also see the role of an operating system, the kernel. It's providing this abstraction layer, this API with the syscalls of open, write, close, and you as a programmer, I can just write Python code, right? I can open and write to files, thanks to the kernel providing us with this interface. And then internally, the kernel might do different things with it. And these device drivers are following certain specification as well, because they need to expect an open or a write, and they need to react to that. Ah, I just love this. Anyway, I hope you learned something. See you tomorrow.